Brazen financial awareness. We're living in tough times right now. Student loans are holding us back, rent keeps increasing, and buying a house is also out of the question for many of us. So you want to start investing, but you either don't have the money or don't know where to start. It does not take that much money to start investing, but most people don't think they can afford to put money aside. How much do you need to get started? You can start with as little or as much as you can afford. The more you have, the better, of course. But if you are drowning in debt, student loans, car payments, rent, you can start small. If you are hurting for cash, you can start out by buying just one share in a high-quality company. Many high-quality companies don't cost that much to purchase just one share. For example, right now, an investor can buy one share in Coca-Cola for less than $50. I'll go into more detail on how to buy shares in companies, but just remember that you don't need to have a lot to get started. Set up your investment account. We'll talk about this more in detail. To automatically transfer over $20, $50, $100, or whatever you are comfortable with weekly from your bank account. Not only are you paying yourself first, your account will also build up and you will be ready to buy investments when the time is right. As you get more comfortable with paying yourself first, you can slowly start increasing the amount you transfer over to your investment account. You can also just deposit a lump sum in your account instead of doing automatic transfers, but the benefit of automatic transfers once set up is that you'll pretty much forget about it and you will barely notice it making a dent in your lifestyle. Once you get used to depositing small amounts, you can slowly start increasing the automatic transfer amount. If you can put even $10 a week to the side, after a year, you will have $520 saved up, which is a start. You will then be able to use that money saved up to purchase different stocks. It's best to start small, because you will be able to mentally bounce back from mistakes you make and losses that will occur. This will also be a good learning experience, which will improve your confidence and analytical skills the longer you invest. If you start small with, let's say, the $520, it will give you more flexibility in your thinking and risk-taking than if you started with a million dollars out the gate. You would be too cautious and terrified to make decisions on your own, and you would be too scared to lose money. When you invest, you continuously educate yourself. There will be slow times, but there will never be a dull moment. Why invest in the stock market at all? The stock market has created many millionaires and billionaires who did not inherit their wealth from their families. This is also where many wealthy individuals park their money and allow it to grow even more. This market, even with its ups and downs, is still the best market to create and grow wealth that investors will need to live on when they are retired. The stock market also allows money to grow faster than inflation. What is a stock? A stock is a share, piece of a company that you can buy or sell on the stock market. A shareholder is a person or company that owns at least one share of a company's stock. A stock or share represents ownership of a company. If a company has 100 shares and you own 10, then you own 10% of the company. Most well-known companies like PepsiCo and McDonald's have billions of shares outstanding, shares on the stock market. So if you only happen to own 5 or 10 shares in these companies, you only own a minuscule part of the company. In the past, stock certificates, which are legal documents that state the specific number of shares you own in a company, were issued to shareholders. If you wanted to buy or sell your shares, stock certificates needed to be transferred from the seller to the buyer. This slows down the process of buying and selling. That's why everything now is handled electronically. You can still request a stock certificate, though. Rumor has it that the very first stock certificate known to mankind was issued by the Dutch East India Company, VOC, in the early 1600s. This certificate is on display at the West Fries Archief in Horn, the Netherlands. Stocks give you the right to vote on the company's operations. You get one vote for each share you own. So if you have 300 shares, you get 300 votes. Voting happens once a year, and you will most likely receive a message to cast your vote on ProxyVote.com. How to Make Money with Stocks 
There are four ways to make money with stocks. The most well-known is buying low and selling high. This technique involves buying shares at one price and selling it when the share price has increased. The difference is your profit. So let's say you bought 100 shares in a company for $5 on Monday, which puts your investment at $500, and seven days later, the stock price climbed up to $6. Your money, capital, just increased, gain, from $500 to $600. Now this $100 gain is unrealized because your money is still in the stock market and it could either go up or down. You decide to sell and received $600. You just gained $100 in realized income, $600 minus $500. The second way you can make money is by selling high and buying low, also called selling short or going short. With this technique, you borrow shares, sell them at a higher price, and then buy them back at a lower price and return the shares you loaned back. The difference is your profit. For example, shares of a company are trading, which means the process of buying and selling at $10. You borrow 100 shares of that company's stock and sell these shares for a total of $1,000, $10 times 100 shares. The stock then drops $3 in value and is now worth $7. You buy back 100 shares at $7 for a total of $700 and return the borrowed 100 shares. You just made $300 profit, sold for $1,000, minus brought back for $700, equals $300. Third, you can make money with stocks by selling call options. With a call option, you give the buyer the right, but not the obligation, to buy your shares at a strike price. For this right, the buyer pays you a premium. For example, you just bought 100 shares in Coca-Cola for $38. You then write an options contract, valid for the next 30 days, to sell the shares at a specific price, let's say $40, strike price. So this means that the buyer has the right, but not the obligation, to buy your shares if the price increases to $40 or beyond over the next 30 days. After these 30 days, the options contract will expire. For this right, the buyer pays you a premium of let's say $1.20 per share. So you immediately get $120, $1.20 times 100 shares, deposited to you. One options contract always consists of 100 shares. So if you are selling four contracts, you are putting 400 shares up for sale. Now how does this benefit the seller or the buyer? From the seller's standpoint, you already receive a quick profit from the premium you received, in this case, $120. Also, if the stock price stayed under $40 for the next 30 days, the buyer will not buy your shares. There is no reason to buy your shares for $40 while the market is selling them for less than $40. So you made a quick $120 in 30 days. Now, if an investor did this each month by writing multiple contracts, he or she can start to increase the invested capital fairly quickly. What happens if the stock increased to $43 within 30 days? More than likely, the buyer will use his or her right to buy the shares at the agreed strike price of $40 a share. In this case, you just made $320 profit, $120 from the premium, and $200 from selling your shares at $40 when you bought them at $38. Remember, you bought 100 shares. Now how did the buyer make money? He or she is already minus $120 in the hole for paying you a premium. But in those 30 days, the stock increased to $43, and the buyer bought them for you at the agreed amount of $40 so the buyer has an unrealized gain of $3, $43 minus $40. If the buyer decides to sell at $43, he or she just made a quick profit of $180. The buyer bought the 100 shares at $40 apiece and sold at $43, which gives the buyer a $300 profit. But the buyer also has to factor in the premium paid, which was $120. Of course, there are risks involved. The seller's main risk is if the stock increases fairly quickly. The seller still has to sell at the agreed-upon strike price. 
The buyer's main risk is the stock not increasing in value and thereby losing money by having paid the premium. This might seem complicated and time-intensive, but it's fairly quick and easy to set up. You can write call options in less than a minute. The final and my most favorite way to make money with stocks, I save the best for last, is by receiving dividends from the stocks you own. The main focus of this book is evaluating dividend-paying stocks. There is a reason why I listed certain companies, like Coke, Procter & Gamble, and Philip Morris, that the billionaires invest in, in the introduction. First, because these are high-quality companies that investors also need to think about investing in. Secondly, these are companies that pay out a dividend quarterly. What's a dividend? A dividend is cold, hard cash that a company pays to its shareholders frequently. Most U.S. dividend-paying companies dish out dividends four times a year, every quarter. The only dividend-paying stocks I look for are stocks that increase their dividends faster than inflation each year. This keeps my money growing faster than inflation. This is extremely important. I want to have my money grow faster than inflation. Inflation is the rise in prices of goods and services over time. This means your money will buy fewer goods or services because it decreased in value. For example, if inflation is 3%, a box of candy that costs $1 today will cost $1.03 next year. Most companies that pay out a dividend are usually blue-chip companies. These are more stable, well-established companies with shares outstanding in the billions. Because they are more well-established and have been in business for many years, they can pay a stable dividend to their shareholders. In times of economic turmoil, blue-chip stocks also get hit, but they are usually able to bounce back as investors tend to gravitate towards them for their stability. According to folklore, the first dividend was paid out by the VOC. The VOC was a company that traveled to Asia to trade commodities with other cultures. The ships that were needed to travel to Asia took quite a beating from the tough winds, storms, and other natural disasters. Not only did the Dutch need more ships, because the market was booming, they also wanted to insure their ships from these natural disasters. They decided to sell shares in the company to their citizens, and in return for buying these shares, they would also receive a dividend. Why do companies pay out dividends? Most companies pay out a dividend to their shareholders as a repayment for the money that the shareholders put in the company by buying the initial shares. You can also see it as a reward to you as a shareholder who bought stock in the company. You invest and believe in the company, and in return, the company gives you a piece of the profit. But don't forget that the company used your money and other shareholders' capital to invest back into the business to hopefully improve the overall value of the business. Also, paying out dividends increases shareholders' loyalty to the company. When a public company or one that is about to go public needs to raise a large amount of cash to expand their business, pay down debt, buy equipment, etc., it can do a couple of things. Loan money from banks. Sell more of its goods or services. Issue shares or go public. Use its equity. Issue a bond. If the company loans money from the bank, it has to pay the bank back with interest, and to sell more goods or services, the company needs fresh new capital to expand whereby it can sell more. So a company might rather decide to issue shares. The benefit of this is that the company decides how many shares it wants to issue to the public. The capital generated from selling these shares on the stock market is then invested back into the business to increase the value of the business. Best of all, the company does not owe the bank any money because it did not take out a loan. A company only makes money from its shares when it goes public, IPO. Going public means a private company sells its shares to stockholders on the stock market. Once these shares are sold, they are in the hands of shareholders and they decide to buy or sell amongst themselves. You can kind of look at it like a video game company that produces a new game but only creates 100,000 copies. They end up selling out all the copies of this new game, so the video game company has made its money. The buyers of these copies are now the owners. They can decide to keep the game 
or sell it to other potential customers for a suitable price. When a company goes public, the amount it sells its shares for and the amount of shares it will sell are the two most important factors to think about. You don't want to sell your shares too cheap because that is money that the company will use to improve its core business. So, if the company does not make any more money from shares it sold on the stock market, why does it care about the stock price? One reason is that management themselves own shares of the company. They usually receive a compensation package that also includes shares in the company. It is, therefore, in their best interest to run the company successfully, which should increase the share price of the stock. Another reason is that companies frequently buy their stocks back, leaving fewer shares outstanding on the stock market. Often, a company reissues shares it bought back if it needs to raise some capital. Issuing shares dilutes your ownership. If a company has 100,000 shares outstanding and you own 10,000, you own 10% of the company. If the company ends up reissuing 50,000 more shares, the total amount of shares outstanding is now 150,000. You still own 10,000, but instead of 10% ownership, you now own 6.7%, 10,000 divided by 150,000 of the company. However, as long as a company buys back more shares than it reissues, this should not be a big concern. Making money is the main reason that investors or shareholders buy stocks. Out of the four ways explained to make money, most people like buying low and selling high because it's the easiest to understand. But there is a community of investors, called value investors, who would rather buy shares in high-quality companies at a discount and hold them for a long period while receiving growing dividends along the way. Secret to Financial Independence The Plan for Financial Freedom the plan is to buy companies that pay out dividends that grow faster than inflation. The dividends received are reinvested or used to buy other companies' stock. This puts an investor's dividend income growth on the fast track because not only is there constant access to fresh investment capital through automatic transfers, the investor also uses the dividends received to snowball and compound wealth. Once an investor builds up his or her dividend income to match or exceed the income generated from their career, they will finally be financially free. Because now, they could just live off the income generated from dividends without having to sell the underlying assets, which are the investments. Once this point is reached, investors also won't have to worry about inflation as their dividend income will keep up and even exceed inflation. They also have an added benefit that these dividend-paying blue-chip companies are more stable and will increase in value along the way. To receive a dividend, you first need to buy a share in a company that pays out a dividend. We'll look into finding these companies and deciding which one is right for a healthy portfolio. The biggest benefits of dividends are that they are more reliable than capital gains, which are the gains your investment make in the stock market. And by doing a little bit of research, you should be able to create a portfolio of high-quality dividend-paying stocks. Consistency from dividends is important because this allows investors to plan their potential income far into the future. There are many companies that consistently raise their dividends. For example, a company like Coca-Cola has paid out an increasing dividend for the last 50 years, and in the last 10 years, They've been able to increase their dividend at an average rate of about 8.96%, 8.45% in the last five years. Table 2.1, Coca-Cola Company Dividend Growth Rate. 2010, dividend, 88 cents. 2011, 94 cents. Dividend growth rate, 6.82%. 2012, dividend, $1.02 cents. Dividend growth rate, 8.51%. 2013. Dividend, $1.12. 12. Dividend growth rate, 9.80%. 2014. Dividend, $1.22. 22. Dividend growth rate, 8.93%. 2015. Dividend, $1.32. 32. Dividend growth rate, 8.93%. 
8.20%. Now you might be thinking, big deal, I buy a couple of shares and I'll receive a little bit in dividend income, it's not worth it. The best way to grow income fast with dividends is to constantly buy stocks in blue chip companies that pay out dividends and then reinvest these dividends that you received to buy more dividend paying stocks or reinvest them in the same companies. This will result in a snowball effect whereby you start small and along the way, your snowball keeps growing up to a point where you don't have to push it anymore since it's able to roll on its own. Also called the compound effect, where you are making money on your money. Dividend income is realized income. So once received, the recipient is free to do with it what he or she wants. Most people are familiar with a 401k because the company that they work with might offer their employees one with a company match. When you invest in a 401k, the money that you make or lose is unrealized income because your money is still in the market. If the value of your 401k increases, we call it a capital gain because your money, capital, has gained in value. Vice versa, a loss is called a capital loss. As long as you keep your capital in the stock market, it has a chance to increase or decrease in value. Your unrealized gains or losses only become realized once you sell your investments. So to summarize, dividends are realized income that a company pays to its shareholders. Once received, the shareholder decides what he or she wants to do with that dividend. They can reinvest it, buy other investments, pay their bills, buy food, go shopping, etc. Now, while looking at the graph earlier, keep in mind that I left out inflation and taxes. The average inflation rate is around 3.2 to 3.5%. So if an investor can buy companies that pay a dividend that increases faster than inflation, minimum of 4%, they will be able to keep their spending power. Right now, dividends are taxed depending on the investor's income and their investment account. Getting paid dividends. The directors of a company decide what the dividend payment should be and when it should be paid out to shareholders. The day of the announcement is also called the declaration date. Let's look at an example of Coca-Cola's declared dividends for the last two years. As seen in Table 2.2, Coca-Cola Company Dividend Dates. Cash amount is the amount of dividend you will receive for one stock. So if you own 10, you want to multiply the cash amount by 10. The declaration date, as stated above, is the date that the directors announce when the next payment will be, the ex-dividend date, and the amount of that payment. The XF dividend date is the date by which you need to own the stock to receive the upcoming dividend payment. The record date is the cutoff date a company uses to determine which shareholders will receive the dividend. Payment date is self-explanatory, and frequency is how frequent the dividend is paid out by the company. Most U.S. companies pay out a dividend quarterly, but some companies pay out monthly dividends. The quickest way to learn the different dates. We'll tell you how much we'll pay you, declaration. You need to own the actual shares to receive a dividend, XF. We'll check to see if you own the shares, record. We'll pay you, payment. The dividend neglect. So how come dividends aren't more popular? Because the majority of investors don't care about dividends. They want to make money fast through capital gains. The story of the tortoise and the hare is a great example of how people operate in the stock market. If you don't know the story, you can find the cartoon on youtube.com. The tortoise, dividend, is the one that everyone laughs at and neglects. But the hare, capital gains, attracts all the attention because he is flashy and exciting. Throughout history, the hare has made millions out of paupers. But even more important, the hare has made people go broke even faster. Throughout that time, the tortoise has been steadily chugging along. Throughout the Great Depression of 1929, the dot-com crash of 2000, and the recent recession of 2008, many companies like Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, Dover, and Unilever still paid an increasing dividend throughout the recent recession, and it is these same boring dividend-paying companies that people flock to when economic turmoil is upon us. 
Now, many companies cut or slashed their dividends in 2008, but even many of these companies bounced back fairly quickly and continued paying dividends. People love their capital gains, and that's what fuels the investment companies. They know that people want to see their money grow fast. That's why you see companies advertising their mutual funds with a one-year return of 21%, five-year return of 20%, and a 10-year return of 11%. Then, when the market crashes, everybody panics and starts selling at a huge loss. Using the Coca-Cola returns from earlier as an example, the initial returns are nothing to brag about. 3.3% the first year, $331.9 over $10,000, 3.72% the second year, and 4.2% the third year. The average investor would laugh at those returns and go with a mutual fund, ETF, or index fund that generates a higher return. But the tortoise keeps chugging along, and at year 34, has a return, or otherwise known as yield on cost, of 13,519.32%. Your Dividend Income Future Now to speed up the process of building a stable dividend income portfolio, because no one wants to wait 34 years before they can enjoy the fruits of their labor, investors should start as early as possible. This will allow investors to have a longer time frame for their dividends to grow. Secondly, investors should invest regularly and not just once like in the example I showed you. Also, investors need to make sure to use the dividend income they receive to buy stock in other dividend companies or reinvest the dividend in the same company. It's okay for investors to start with a small amount and once they get more comfortable and see those dividends rolling in constantly, they can increase the amount of money they use for investing. They will then be able to track their dividend income and growth since this is far more stable than capital gains. For example, if an investor has a goal of receiving $100,000 in dividend income, they'll be able to calculate how much they need to invest regularly, what their dividend growth rate must be, and how many years it will take for them to hit this goal. Also, if working at a job is not providing enough money to invest, then additional avenues need to be explored for making extra money. Work a second job, starting a side business, getting into rental income properties, or creating and selling products are good places to start. Whatever the side hustle is, it has to be legal. So, if investors plan on retiring within 20, 15, 10, or even 5 years with a dividend income strategy, it behooves them to be more diligent with investing and reinvesting their dividends to create wealth faster. How come not all companies pay out dividends? Every single business in existence goes through the business life cycle. There are many stages in a business life cycle. We will look at four different stages. A business always starts as an idea and moves through different stages. One of the first stages is the startup phase. These are fairly new companies that might get funding from a venture capitalist or angel investors. You will often hear on the news or the internet about high-tech companies in the startup phase. Once the business gains some momentum by finding a customer base and fine-tuning its products or services, it will switch over to the growth phase. Now, a company can either be profitable in the growth stage, or the owners might have a plan to get it into the profit zone. In the growth phase, a company might also decide to initiate an IPO, which means an initial public offering. This is when the company makes its shares available on the stock market. These companies are focused on growing, so any money that they receive or generate is reinvested back into the company. For example, companies like Google, Twitter, and Tesla. In the maturity phase, a company has been able to penetrate the market, find its foothold, and finally become stable. Think about companies like Walmart or Unilever. These companies don't take too many risks because they are established. It is at the maturity stage that most companies start paying out dividends. Once the products or services from a company fall out of favor with its customers, the company will shift into a decline phase and phase out. Think of products like cassette tapes, Polaroid pictures, and the Walkman. Where do dividends come from? Companies pay out dividends from the net income they generate. 
The net income is the bottom line earnings of the company. So this is the profit or loss a company ends up with after all their expenses, employee salaries, taxes, etc. are paid. A company can do a couple of things with their earnings. Invest it in new projects. Buy or fix equipment, buildings. Buy back shares outstanding. Pay down debt. Pay out dividends to shareholders. Most companies that pay out dividends are sitting on piles of cash that they don't have to reinvest back in the business. Most of these companies can also pay down their long-term debt within a couple of years. It is best for these companies to either buy back their shares or pay their shareholders a dividend who can then take this money and invest it in other companies or do with it whatever they want. Most companies do a combination of these different things with their earnings. The Stock Market Exposed Super dot market makers, bid ask spread, level 2 quotes, intraday trading, Fibonacci, and who could ever forget the dead cat bounce? Oh yes, the stock market can get somewhat complicated, but let's try to keep it simple. The stock market facilitates the buying and selling of securities, such as stocks, currencies, commodities, and futures. The trading of stocks happens on stock exchanges. These can be on a physical trading floor or a virtual one. If you've ever seen the movie Trading Places, you've seen what a trading floor used to look like. People are yelling and screaming, making hand gestures, and pieces of paper are flying everywhere. Nowadays, it's less noisy because brokers can initiate trades on their handheld gadgets. So there is no need to yell and holler, sell and buy prices. The most prominent stock exchanges in the U.S. are the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. It's on these two stock exchanges that you can trade most of the companies in the U.S. Also, the NASDAQ is virtual, so there is no trading floor. Many developed nations have their own stock exchanges. The United Kingdom has the London Stock Exchange, Canada has the Toronto Stock Exchange, and the Netherlands has the AEX, and so on. On what stock exchange a company trades depends mostly on its market cap. The market capitalization of a company is calculated by taking the amount of shares outstanding times the share price. The market cap is the total value of a company on the stock market. So if a company is trading at $20 and has 1 billion shares outstanding, the market cap of this company would be $20 billion. Big, well-known companies like Walmart and McDonald's have a market cap in the billions. The most used classifications are Large cap, $10 billion or more market cap Mid cap, between $2 billion and $10 billion Small cap, less than $2 billion You might also hear about nano cap and micro cap, but the most used market cap classifications are the three mentioned earlier. Smaller cap companies are listed on the OTC stock exchange in pink sheets. These smaller companies could be microcap stocks, nano cap, or even penny stocks. Stocks on these stock exchanges are unregulated, so you should be extra careful when investing in these types of stocks. Don't get scammed and slammed. Many people get scammed by being promised easy riches. What usually happens is a salesman reaches out to you by phone, internet, or even in person. He will give you a sales pitch about a shady company or investment, and you fall for the pitch because all you can see are dollar signs. So you end up owning shares in this company and everything seems to be going good in the beginning. Then all of a sudden, the stock price tanks and you just lost your shirt. You just experienced a pump and dump. This is how it works. A company is trading on the OTC BB Stock Exchange. Now, this company might be a real company or a fake one that doesn't even have employees. This company's shares are trading at a low price, so a con man buys a lot of shares for cheap in this company. They then start advertising this company and the price of the stock starts to increase. Once it has increased up to a certain point, the scammer sells all his shares at this high price and makes a killing. The price of the stock immediately drops and people start panicking and sell their shares at a huge loss. So the con man pumped up the price of the shares by getting many investors to purchase these shares in the hope of making money. Then he sells all his shares which sparks the fast decline of the price of the stock.
which will be the dump. A con man in this case might be a person, a group of people, or even legitimate banks and investment companies. However, there are day traders, investors who buy and sell stocks within a day, that can see a pump and dump coming from a mile away and can make a killing by playing the market. Average investors should stay far away from this technique. Where to buy stocks? Investors like you and I don't have the time to go to New York and start selling and buying shares on the New York Stock Exchange, NYSE, trading floor. This is where a broker comes into play. A broker is a firm that handles the buying and selling of securities on your behalf, at a commission. There are full-service brokers and discount brokers. Full-service brokers give you investment advice and charge a higher commission for selling or buying equity. The Internet has propelled the discount broker. These brokers have cut the cost of commissions for their investors and let them do all the legwork for deciding which companies to invest in. I only use discount brokers for buying dividend-paying stocks. In the ancient days, you would open your newspaper and read about stock quotes. You would then visit or call your broker and let him know that you wanted to buy or sell stocks. He would send a message out to the marketplace by placing a phone call. A representative of your brokerage firm would pick up and write on a piece of paper your order. He would walk over to the trading floor and give your order to the floor broker, who would then try to negotiate a good price for you. The floor consists of both buyers and sellers, so when the negotiation takes place, it involves yelling out buy or sell orders and making hand gestures to let buyers or sellers know that they want to buy on behalf of their client, what the price will be, and how many securities. Once the order is complete, your broker will get a confirmation phone call. He will then tell you that your order was executed successfully or call you at home and leave you a message. For using the services of your broker, you paid a commission, which was more than $100 for a trade. Nowadays, you can still go to your broker's office or call them to place an order. But with the advancement that the internet has brought us, you can execute orders yourself online through discounted brokers. Commission cost has come down considerably, with average commissions between $5 to $10. Stock chart. You can track the performance of every stock online. One website that I like to use is Google Finance. If you look at the image above, figure 3.1, PepsiCo stock chart starting from January 2015, you'll notice we are looking at the Pepsi stock. Every stock on a stock exchange has a ticker symbol. PepsiCo ticker is PEP. You can see the price movement of the stock, in this case by month, and if you hover over the chart, you will see additional information about the stock at a specific period. On the right side, you see numbers that represent a dollar amount. So 100 is $100, and 95 is $95, etc. You can, therefore, follow the price of the stock at a specific date. The volume chart below is the number of trades placed for the stock. The letter D on the chart is the XF dividend date, and above that is the dividend amount. The stock chart moves from left to right. Many investors are glued to stock charts and decide to buy and sell depending on where they think the price will move to. You can see that the stock closed at $100.10 on November 20th. Next to the price of the stock, you see the range of the day. This is the range the stock was trading for the day. The 52-week is the range the stock was trading at for the last 52 weeks. Open is what price the stock started trading for the day. The average volume is the amount of buying and selling of shares. Market cap is the price of the stock times the number of shares outstanding, which also represents the total value of the company on the stock market. We will go into more debt about the PE, dividend yield, and EPS. Shares represents the number of shares outstanding on the stock market. Investors trade these shares with each other. Beta is the historical volatility of the stock compared to the market. A higher beta means the stock is more volatile in terms of its price movement. Higher beta stocks are considered higher risk. Institutional ownership shows you the percentage of shares outstanding in the hands of investment banks, mutual funds, pension funds, retirement accounts, and more. 
There is, of course, a lot more that can be said about stock charts. It is best to start familiarizing yourself with it by checking it out frequently. S&P 500 You might hear about the S&P 500 in the news a lot. The S&P 500 tracks 500 large-cap U.S. company stocks. These stocks represent the overall economy. So you might hear on the news that the S&P 500 increased by 200 points. One point is one dollar. That means that all the 500 companies the S&P tracks on average increased. Now, if the S&P 500 has been losing points daily, it might mean that the stock market is pessimistic about the economy and it's trending downwards. Some of the companies that the S&P 500 tracks are ExxonMobil, Apple, Microsoft, Procter & Gamble, General Electric, these companies also hold a considerable amount of weight in the S&P 500. There are other indexes, like the Dow Jones, which tracks 30 large-cap companies. You also have the S&P Small Cap 600 and the S&P Mid Cap 400, the Russell 2000 Index, and the list goes on. An index is used to gauge the performance of its underlying companies. 2-1 Split Every once in a while, a company might decide to do a two-for-one stock split. This means that a company is dividing the number of stocks they have outstanding. If a company's stock price was $110 and it had $1 million shares outstanding after a 2-1 split, the stock price would be $55 and there are now $2 million shares. Companies do this when their stock price becomes too high. This might scare investors in purchasing such a high stock price. After a 2-1 split, the share of the company looks more affordable. Another reason is for liquidity, which means the ease of selling and buying of the stock. If there are more shares on the market at a cheaper price, it makes the stock more liquid. If you are an investor who owns the stock, a 2-1 split would give you double the number of shares. So if you had 30 stocks, a 2-1 would give you 30 extra for a total of 60 stocks. The price of the stock and your dividends are halved, but totaling up your shares will give you the same dividend amount and share amount you had before the 2-1 split. Are you scared of the market? Many people are too afraid to invest in the market because they have been burned or they know someone who has been burned. Let's look at some of the most memorable stock market crashes. The Stock Market Crash of 1929 The crash of 1929, which led to the Great Depression, has been the worst in history. Before the crash, the economy was booming, everyday citizens were making money, and they were looking at other avenues to grow their wealth. Many investors were familiar with government bonds that the government issued to fund the war. People started speculating in the stock market and buying many stocks on margin. This allowed investors to borrow money to buy stocks. So you could put down a certain percentage, let's say 30%, to buy stocks and your broker would loan you the other 70%. There was no rule set up to limit the amount you could borrow on margin. To make matters even worse, many brokers were advising their clients to buy on margin since everyone was doing it and it was a quick way to make money fast. One problem with buying on margin, besides it being high risk, is that if the stocks you buy fall below a certain threshold, your broker will call in the margin. This means that you will have to pay all the money that you loaned back to your broker. When the market crashed, all the people that bought their stocks on margin not only lost the money that they invested in the market, they also lost the money they borrowed from the broker. In those days, many people put their whole retirement savings in the market. Since the value of the securities, stocks, fell below a certain threshold, the brokers started calling in the margins. This left people broke and bankrupt. Buying on margin was, of course, not the only element that led to the Great Depression, but it did play a huge part. You can still buy securities on margin, but there are limits placed on how much you can borrow. In the early 1920s, the stock market was only accessed by a small group of people, also known as Wall Street. These were the big financial institutions, such as banks, but also rich and wealthy individuals of that time. By introducing Main Street to the stock market, which are retail investors like you and me, 
a new injection of capital flooded the stock market. Not everyone lost money in those days, though. Many insiders, big banks, and brokers started buying stocks at a cheap price, pumping up the stock, and when retail investors jumped in to buy these stocks, the big banks dumped their shares back on the market, making millions in the process and leaving Main Street with these stocks that ended up crashing. They used the old pump-and-dump method. The market works on greed and fear. When a stock is climbing higher, many people start taking notice and jump on board and try to ride this seemingly endless increase in stock price. The reverse also holds true. People's fears kick in when a stock that they own drops in value. Once an increasingly large number of investors start selling, everybody jumps on board and starts selling also because they are afraid they will lose everything. Because of the Great Depression, President Roosevelt set up the Security and Exchange Commission. The SEC regulates the securities market. It enforces the law and has to make sure it is scrupulous in protecting investors. Dot-com crash. The dot-com crash took place at the beginning of this millennium and lasted for a few years. Many people called the dot-com era the new economy. This was supposed to be an age where the sky was the limit because everything happened in cyberspace. There were no physical limitations. The only limit was in your mind. A 12-year-old kid could set up a website and get traffic flowing to it, and without making any money, he could sell the same site for millions, based on the potential of the site. Stories of young people becoming millionaires overnight were not uncommon. Venture capitalists started flooding the market with cash, buying websites that never made any money. They then turned these private internet companies public through an IPO, initial public offering, which made it possible for retail investors to buy stock in these websites. People started getting greedy and started buying stocks in internet companies like No Tomorrow. They neglected companies like Emerson Electric, Dover, and Procter & Gamble because those companies were old and boring. Why invest in companies that pay a dividend but see a slower increase in their stock price when you can buy an internet stock that has the chance of increasing over 40% in value in a couple of days? Most of these internet companies never made any money, but people started valuing these companies on how many clicks they got or how many visitors went to the site daily. Everybody was buying these stocks based on the potential of these companies. Even highly reputable investment banks and brokers were advising their clients to ditch other safer stocks and buy internet stocks instead. The greed of investors shot up many stocks into the stratosphere, and a bubble started forming. This bubble burst in 2000, and many people lost more than they could stomach. Everybody lost money, right? Not exactly. The same bankers and venture capitalists who owned many of these internet companies when they were private were able to sell their shares in these companies after they went public with their IPO and made millions in the process by selling these overvalued shares to retail investors. The money they made was then used to play the same game over and over again, buying other internet companies and going through with the IPO. They were the first to own the overvalued shares at a cheap price, and after the price of the stock was pumped up high enough, they dumped their stocks on the market by selling them. The old pump and dump never fails, always catching greedy retail investors and eventually leaving them broke. The Great Recession The Great Recession was kicked into high gear by the boom and bust of the housing market. Investors looking to invest their money and receive a greater return on their investment started speculating in the housing market. Eventually, mortgage lenders loaned money to high-risk citizens who ended up defaulting on their mortgage payments. The lender then ends up getting the house. As more people started defaulting, the lender ended up with an increased amount of houses that they did not receive any mortgage payments on. Prices on homes dropped all over the country because of the large number of vacant houses. This sharp decline in housing prices left the homeowners that were still paying their mortgage wondering why they were paying off a mortgage of, let's say, $200,000 while the house now is only worth $70,000. This housing crisis did not only affect rich investors because other institutions like commercial banks and lenders also had skin in the game. What happened was similar to a domino effect. Everything started falling down. 
And since many financial institutions worldwide also had their hands in the cookie jar, their nations felt this collapse also. But here is the interesting part. If we take a look at the stock chart for Pepsi, you can see that the crash started in the middle of 2008. The price of PepsiCo stock went as high as $78.46 at the end of 2007 and dropped as low as $47.10 in 2009. The stock dropped 39.96%. But look at the dividends that Pepsi paid out. Before, during, and after this whole debacle, Pepsi never stopped paying and increasing its dividend. Buy and sell with confidence. To start buying stocks in different companies, you need to have a brokerage account. Setting up a brokerage account is easy, and you can set one up online. Some of the most well-known brokerage accounts at the moment are Ally, E-Trade, Capital One Investing, TD Ameritrade. A quick Google search, and you can find many more. It's always best to shop around and compare features from all these different brokerage accounts. While comparing, here is what you should look for. Commission rates, cost per trade, customer service ratings, minimum deposit, different tools available, no-cost dividend reinvestment plan, DRP. I recommend checking out TradeKing.com. You can have your account up and running in no time. They also have pretty good research tools. Opening an account is free. They allow DRPs, and their commission rate at the moment is only $4.95. The Dividend Reinvestment Plan, DRP, allows you to reinvest the dividends that you receive. You can start a DRP with just one share. The dividend that you receive will allow you to buy a portion of a share commission-free. So if you received a $1 dividend and the stock that will be reinvested in is trading for $50, you will purchase 2% of the share, $1 over $50. When you log into your brokerage account, you will see how much funds you have in your account available to trade. You can add more money or transfer money out of your account from the cash balance depending on which account type you own. Each brokerage account has a different interface but most of them will have the basic features, such as buying and selling stocks, your account balance, security research tools, customer service, order status, and history. The best way to get comfortable with the interface will be to just go in, start clicking around, and learn how the system works. You can also reach out to customer service and every account usually has a help section you can browse through. Brokerage account type. Whenever you set up your account, you will also select your account type. See below for a list of the most prominent accounts. Traditional Individual Brokerage Account, IRA, Roth IRA, Individual Retirement Account, SEP, 401k, 403b, 529 plans, Education Savings Account, Qualified Plans, Health Savings Account, MyRA, my Retirement Account. Each account has its nuances. For example, a traditional account allows you to buy any type of equity on the market. There are no limits on how much money you can deposit in this account. You will, however, have to pay taxes on dividends and capital gains if you sell your shares because this is a taxable account. The 401k Retirement Account is what most people are familiar with because most companies now allow their employees to enroll in one. A 401k is an employer-sponsored retirement plan. Most often, there is also a company match to entice employees to invest in their 401k. The 401k is an example of a tax-deferred account. The IRA and Roth IRA are both popular accounts that you can open if your employer does not offer a 401k. You can also open these accounts even if you already have a 401k. With an IRA, you end up paying taxes once you withdraw money out of your account at retirement age. With a Roth IRA, on the other hand, you pay taxes on your income now and you can withdraw money tax-free when you are retired. The age at which you can start withdrawing is 59.5. This, however, might change in the future. With the 401k and the IRA Roth IRA accounts, 
There are certain penalties you should pay attention to if you plan on withdrawing your money early. You will be hit with a 10% early withdrawal penalty. There are exceptions, however. Qualified first-time home buyers can withdraw up to $10,000 penalty-free, and your Roth IRA contributions can be withdrawn tax-free. Just the contributions, though, not the capital gains, dividends, or money you received from options. If you work at a company that offers a 401k with a company match, you should take advantage of that because the company match is free money given to you. If you're just starting out buying stocks in individual companies, I suggest you open a Roth IRA account. You won't have to pay taxes on qualified dividends that you receive, and you can reinvest these dividends to let your money grow. I can go on forever about the advantages and disadvantages of all these accounts, but make sure you talk to a professional advisor about your options and choices. To keep it simple, I would do this. If I worked at a company that offers a 401k, I would be sure to enroll in one, especially if my company pays a match. Next, I would open a Roth IRA account with any of the previously stated brokerage firms. I recommend TradeKing.com to start trading. Last, if I am comfortable buying and selling stocks, I would also open a traditional brokerage account. I would then have immediate access to the dividends I received, but I will have to pay taxes on my dividend income depending on the state I live in and my income. Buying a stock. Buying or selling stocks online is even easier than shopping online. You navigate to the trading section of your brokerage account. You specify if you want to buy or sell a stock, enter the number of shares you want to buy, enter the ticker symbol. You will get a pop-up that shows you what the current price of the stock is on the market. Enter the order type and the duration. Hit review or preview order and submit your order. Depending on the order type that you choose, the order might complete immediately. Once the order is complete, you will see the stock in your portfolio after about three business days. That's it. Whenever you are buying stocks online, you will notice a couple of different order types. The market, limit, stop, stop limit, and trailing stop order. A market order is an order that fires immediately. So once you place an order for one share of Pepsi, you will receive one stock at the market price at that moment. The market does not stay still. So looking at the image, figure 4.1, buying one share in a Scott Trade account. The $101.23 for a Pepsi stock could be a different price just one second later. This is for both buying and selling of stock. A limit order allows you to buy or sell stock at a certain price. Let's say I wanted to pay $100 for the Pepsi stock above. I could put a limit order for $100. This order will only execute once the price of the Pepsi stock drops down to $100 or beyond. This is my favorite order type when placing orders. With a stop order, you place a stop price to buy or sell stock. If I put a stop order for $101, the order will wait until the price drops down to $101 and it will then turn into a market order and execute. Many investors use this stop order to prevent them from taking further losses. If you know you bought a stock at a certain price and would sell at another price, you could use a stop order. If an investor bought the Pepsi stock for $101 and would want to sell it if it dropped to $80, the investor could use a stop order. A stop limit order is a combination of the stop and a limit order. The stop price will convert this order into a buy or sell order and the limit price will be the price at which the order will execute. The trailing stop is mostly used by investors who want to sell their stock and still enjoy a quick profit from the sale. With a trailing stop, you specify a percentage or points at which you would want to sell under the market price. If you bought stock at $50 and you put a sell trailing stop at 10%, if the price of the stock falls down to $45, the stock would sell because it hit that 10% you specified. Now, if the stock moved up to $55, the trailing stop at 10% would trail the stock also and would now only sell if the stock dropped to $49.50 because 10% of $55 is $5.50.
so the trailing stop would execute at $55 minus $5.50, which equals $49.50. Selling a stock. Whenever you sell your stocks, you need to know what the accompanying tax burden will be. If you even have to pay taxes will first depend on what type of brokerage account you are using. You are either using a tax-deferred or a taxable account. With a taxable account, you will have to pay taxes on the sale of stocks and the dividends you received. With a tax-deferred account, however, these taxes are deferred until a later date, paid up front, or until a particular date. If you are using a taxable account, you will have to pay a capital gains tax, which is the profits you received from the rise of the stocks after you purchased it, if you held the stocks longer than a year. If you held them less than a year and sold them, you will have to pay your ordinary income tax rate. If you had a capital loss, you can deduct the loss up to a certain amount from your tax bill. The selling of stocks itself is really easy. All the different buy order types apply to the sell orders, but there is an additional sell order called sell short, which we have explained in Chapter 1. Commission. Whenever you buy or sell stocks, you have to pay your brokerage firm a commission fee. The commission fee is usually between $5 to $10 at online discount brokers. There is no set rule on this, but whenever I buy stocks, I make sure that the commission is 1% or less of the total order. If my commission is $4.95, I try to buy around $500 worth of stocks or more. The reason for this is you would otherwise pay too much in commission. If you bought three shares at $20 a piece and your commission fee is $4.95, your total order would be $64.95. Your commission would be 7.6%, $4.95 over $64.95 of your total order, which is too high a price to pay. Your money is not safe. Is the best place to park your money in the stock market or not? What other vehicles can you use to park your money? Under the mattress. Just saving cash and keeping it on hand year after year is not the smartest thing to do. Besides the immediate threat of someone breaking in and stealing your money or your house burning down, you also have to think about inflation and how it will impact your spending power in the future. Savings account. Back in 2006-2007, you could get a savings account with a 5-6% to interest rate. Nowadays, you'll be lucky if you can get one above 1%. Even though your money in a savings account seems safe, it's losing its purchasing power. If inflation on average is 3.5% per year, which means goods and services will get more expensive next year, then your dollar today is only worth 96.5 cents next year. Most people keep their money in a savings account for fear of losing it if they invested it. But throughout the years, your money is worthless. This also goes for CDs, since their interest rates have declined also. Mutual funds. A mutual fund is a fund where a large group of investors' money is pooled together and then used to invest in different securities such as stocks and bonds. If you buy shares in a mutual fund, you own a small percentage of these different securities, which makes for a diversified portfolio. As you know by now, stocks are considered the riskiest investments. To limit that risk, a financial professional who manages a mutual fund tries to spread the risk over a large number of securities. The problem with mutual funds is that there are many fees associated with them, such as management fees, administrative fees, reinvestment fees, front-end load, back-end load, and more. The fee that I always look at is the expense ratio, which is the percentage that your financial institution charges yearly. These expense ratios can range from under 0.5% to above 1%. If you had an investment capital of $100,000 in this mutual fund with a 0.5% expense ratio, you would pay $500 in expenses for that year. If after a few years your investment grew to $200,000, you would now pay $1,000 at a 0.5% expense ratio. That is a high price to pay because you could have taken that $1,000 and invested it yourself. Keep in mind that when you buy stocks yourself, 
The only cost you have to pay is the commission fee when you buy or sell securities. Another problem with mutual funds is that you lose your voting rights. The institution or financial professional that owns the mutual fund has all the voting rights. 401k. Most companies now offer their employees the option to contribute percentage or fixed dollar amount to their 401k. I like the 401k, but whenever you sign up for one at work, your options on what you can invest in are limited to what investment plans the company offers. Popular 401k funds right now are the target date retirement funds. These usually have a year at the end, like Vanguard Target Retirement 2055. The year represents the year of retirement, which means that the fund might start out with having 70 to 80% of the portfolio in stocks. But the closer it gets to your retirement date of 2055, it's going to gradually rebalance the portfolio to increase safer investments like bonds and decrease the allocation of riskier investments like stocks. Same as with the mutual funds, there are expenses that you need to pay attention to and you don't have voting rights. Index funds and ETFs. It seems like everybody is ranting and raving about index funds and ETFs. There are plenty of studies online that show that most financial planners cannot consistently beat the market. So you have an index like the S&P 500, which represents the 500 biggest companies of the U.S. A financial planner's job might be to beat the S&P 500, and when looking at a 10-year frame, most financial planners underperform the market. So here you are, paying all these expenses to a financial institution, and on average, they cannot even beat the market. This is where index funds come in. An index fund invests in the same companies as the index it tracks and holds the same weight percentage of these securities. It's basically a mirror of the index it tracks. A very popular one is the VFINX. It has a low expense ratio of 0.17%. Expenses are so low on index funds because they are managed by computers. Minimal human involvement is necessary compared to mutual funds and target date retirement funds. Even though there are many different index funds and ETF investments, my first concern is that they invest in companies that I would not invest in. If you just look at the top companies by weight that are in the S&P 500, you will see a lot of tech companies that don't pay a dividend and large banks. The only banks I invest in are local banks that keep their financial books easy to analyze. The problem with bigger banks is that they complicate their business practices on purpose. It then gets up to a point where no one is held accountable if something goes wrong. Because of the complicated nature of bigger banks, it's hard to hold someone accountable. With index funds, your wealth only increases when your shares increase in value, stock moves up in price, there are only three directions a stock can move, up, down, or sideways. Referencing figure 5.1, growth of $10,000 in the stock market. If you had $10,000 invested in an index fund at the end of November 2005, 1, your money would grow to $12,630 at its peak in 2007, 2. But let's look at 2009. Your invested $10,000 is worth only $6,192.86 at its lowest point, 3, on February 28, 2009, because the stock market crashed and it took until March 2010 to reach and pass the $10,000 mark, 4. In a little over four years, your invested capital has gone pretty much nowhere, but 10 years later, it would be worth $20,146.82, 5. So you could look at it as just staying the course would still put you ahead of the game and beat out inflation. However, hindsight is 2020. What if a percentage of your portfolio had $100,000 invested in an index fund and the stock market crash dropped your investment in this fund to $62,000? That is a loss of 32%. Would you panic? Would you sell your shares and buy safer but lower return investments such as bonds? What if you were about to retire around 2008-2009 and you had an investment account of $1 million? Most of it was invested in safer securities such as treasury bills and bonds, but a good percentage, let's say 30%,
was still invested in stocks. The stock market crash just drops the stock's portion by 32%. So the $300,000 you had invested in stocks is now only worth $204,000, which was a loss of $96,000. This instantly affects your retirement plans because you were planning on living off your $1 million, which is now worth around $900,000. Plus, don't forget about all those costs that your financial institution charges. With the $1 million originally built up, you were going to apply the 4% rule that most financial planners advise to use when drawing money out of your account for retirement. The 4% rule. The 4% rule states that you should be able to live off 4% of your retirement income for 20 to 30 years. So, with a $1 million portfolio, drawing 4% would be $40,000 out of your account in the first year. Your retirement account value would swing up and down based on market movement and which investments you are invested in, bonds, stocks, mutual funds, etc. Here is the problem with the 4% rule. If your investment dropped to $900,000 because of the stock market crash, a 4% withdrawal will only give you $36,000 instead of $40,000. So if you still want that $40,000, you need to withdraw an additional 0.5%. You might be thinking that this is not a big deal, because when the market is booming, you will be able to take out less than 4%. And in times of distress, you might have to take out a little more than 4%. So it all evens out. This brings me to the second issue I have with the 4% rule which is that you are selling your assets for money. Think about a car you own which you are constantly stripping for money. You start with a brand new or slightly used car that is paid for, so it's your property you use to drive to and from work. Because you need money badly, you start selling parts of your car every month. First, you start with your radio, then your speakers, and then your back seat. Before you know it, your car will be worth nothing. Now, you might think, that's why we have bonds and annuities. But even with these securities, you need to make sure that they are inflation-averse. There are certain annuities, however, that pay out increasing payments. When a shareholder invests for dividends, the investor does not have to sell their assets because they will live off their dividends that the asset pays them. Also, many dividend companies still pay out an increasing dividend even during a market crash. Just look at the image below of PepsiCo dividend payments. In figure 5.2, PepsiCo stock chart starting from 2007. Not only did PepsiCo continue to pay out quarterly dividends during the housing crisis of 2008-2009, but they also increased their quarterly dividend from 43 cents to 45 cents. They paid out a total dividend of $1.67 per share in 2008 and $1.78 in 2009. This is a dividend increase of 6.6%. You might have a retirement plan, and you decide that you will grow it to around $1 million at retirement age. Your retirement assets will mostly consist of safer investments. You decide to live off $50,000 per year from your $1 million nest egg. Take a look at your buying power after 20 years based on 3.5% inflation rate. As seen in Figure 5.3, buying power decline over 20 years. In year 1, you draw out $50,000. Year 2, you still draw out $50,000, but your buying power has decreased to $48,250 because of inflation. In year 20, your $50,000 has a buying power of a little over $25,000. So your buying power is halved in 20 years. If you have set up your investments to keep up with inflation, you should be able to increase the amount you withdraw while still maintaining your buying power. But many unexpected things happen in life. Medical costs are rising. You might have to replace an old car that is starting to cost you too much to repair, home renovation, and more things we do not account for. Women, on average, also live longer than men. This means that they will have to stretch their nest egg even longer. As stated earlier, when investing in dividend-paying stocks, investors don't have to worry about selling the assets they own in their investment portfolio because they will live off the dividend income generated. How much an investor needs to generate in dividend income to live prosperously is up to them.
I would recommend building up dividend income to twice the amount you make at your job.